Hello, my name is Brinton Piper. Today I'd like to discuss the practice of redlining in America. Redlining is a method of restricting access to a certain group of people by denying them mortgage loans or even the ability to rent a home in certain areas of cities. It's important because it helps describe just one of many forms of systemic racism in this country and the lasting effects of them on minorities. The topic stems from my growth as I described in my personal narrative and my journey to become anti-racist. In the process of researching this topic, I had to be very specific on my searches. This led me to ask how redlining affected African Americans' generational wealth, how it affected their quality of schooling, and how it has impacted the crime rates in the areas of formerly redlined neighborhoods. So, how did redlining impact the generational wealth of African Americans? In the process of researching this question, I found the article, Being Black Lowers the Value of My Home, The Legacy of Redlining, by Michelle Singletary. This online article from the Washington Post discusses how communities that are predominantly African American today are valued less than nearly identical communities that are made of predominantly white homeowners. In fact, they can be undervalued by as much as 65%. The author also describes that the 2019 Federal Reserve Survey of Consumer Finances shows that 45% of black families own their homes with a median home value of $150,000. That compares with a 73.7% home ownership rate for white families with a median home value of $230,000. Those gaps, home ownership compounded by home value, are a major reason the typical white family has almost eight times the wealth of a typical black family. Another article I found for the same question was, Blacks Will Take Hundreds of Years to Catch Up to White Wealth, by Tanzina Vega. This article from CNN Business describes, if current trends persist, it will take 228 years for black families to accumulate the same amount of wealth as whites, according to a report released from the Corporation for Economic Development and the Institute for Policy Studies. Over the past 30 years, the average household wealth of white families has grown 85% to $656,000, while that of blacks has climbed just 27% to $85,000 and Latinos 69% to $98,000. These articles were extremely helpful in answering my first question, not only because of the trustworthiness of the sources, but also because the authors drew conclusions based on their own experiences. Next, what has the impact been on the quality of education on formerly redlined communities? This question also came back with great articles, but one in particular gave me excellent data. These school district lines highlight segregation hotspots in Michigan by Kate Wells, provided statistical data and research regarding current segregation in many school districts across Michigan. Although the author's main point is a call to action to redraw school district boundaries, it specifically discusses the disparities between black and white school districts. According to Wells, Oak Park School District is 97% non-white. Berkeley School District is just 25% non-white. There's a 14% gap in their poverty rates, and Oak Park gets $4,182 less in per-pupil funding when you combine both local and state revenue. Those disparities play out in student performance, too. In Berkeley, 67% of students are proficient in all subjects on state tests, well above the state average of 40%. But in Oak Park, only 11% of students are proficient on those same tests. The, t the statistical data the author provides is crucial for developing answers to my second question. Finally, is there a correlation between redlining and violent crime rates? For this question, I found an article on story maps called The Persistent Effects of Redlining in Baltimore by Jonathan Peck. This source provided me with fantastic data with the city of Baltimore as the example. The author describes numerous effects of redlining, but has specific data regarding violent crime that I found intriguing and pertinent. The correlation between areas with large numbers of homicide and areas which were formerly redlined or yellow-lined is particularly striking. All areas with especially high homicide rates over the past 14 years are largely or wholly within or surrounded by redlined or yellow-lined districts. The author continues to say, 
Clearly, the preponderance of lethal violence in modern Baltimore remains concentrated in redlined and yellow line neighborhoods. The author refers to data from numerous sources, including the U.S. Census Bureau. This article is full of information, not only on crime, but also on current segregation and average income differences throughout the city. In conclusion, these sources will assist me going forward by providing answers to my questions, all from reputable sources. In Unit 3, the sources I have found should substantially assist me in developing a well-curated and thoughtful research paper. I hope you find this topic as intriguing, albeit infuriating, as I did.